about 46 billion per year, that is 2010, and we have 230,000 researchers. And the share is about 45% public and 55 private. And it's clear then, in a country like France, we cannot keep these two worlds separate. We have to play synergy among them. And what we have done in, in the recent past, in the last uh, five to seven years, is in blue. And the heart of everything are the competitiveness cluster. This morning we discussed a lot about that. And what are competitiveness cluster in the French system uh, is very simple. If you have in a, in a given territory, in a given region, you have an excellent industry with excellent laboratories and you have education, then you can apply for a competitiveness cluster. And what is in practice is a kind of forum People go there, discuss, know each other, make a roadmap, and eventually they make project together. And when they make project, the state gives money to help. And I think the role of the state is to trigger this movement. We put 3 billion euro, starting from 2005 until now, and in reality we put much more, if you are a public laboratory, and if you are a public laboratory and you applied and got the Carnot label, then you are entitled to get even more money every time you make a contract with the industry. The only condition is that the laboratory must be excellent and must have a sound record of working with the industry. And why we give additional money if they get already a contract with the industry is because we want to be sure that they continue to be excellent in research. We do not want to get our public laboratory, corporate laboratories of a given company. And then you find in green three new objects that are called the Technology Research Institute, the Decarbonated Energy Institute, and what I would say, the Technology Transfer Funds. And these one are new objects that uh, we are going to create, the first one in, in a couple of weeks, and it's thanks to the special investment plan that was decided by the President of the Republic that decided last year to put a 35 billion euro, of which 22 for research and education. And he called that the investment for the future. We have a crisis that is clear, but if we do not invest for the future, we are lost. That is what my ministry uh, is responsible for. And you see just dotted ellipse, uh, sorry, red ellipse around and that are the four and a half billion out of the 22 that we will put to accelerate the technological transfer. What are these objects? And that is my last view graph. What are the Technolo Technological Research Institute and the Decarbonated Energy Institute? It's quite simple. You have the competitiveness cluster, and now imagine that somebody tell you, okay, I want to do more. I want to make a program over five to ten years, and I'm ready to gather together people in the same place, in the same institute, half public, half of an industry. I put half of the money from public, half from uh, the private, and in that way we hope to have real research groups that work in the same place, not only on the short term, but also on the medium and the long term. And for this object, we will give 3 billion euro over the next 10 years. And now there is another object that was missing. Somebody said incubators are essential, and we have already 
a, a special agency that take care of incubator, but we will go further, again, with the logic of the competitiveness cluster. We say, okay, in each region, we put a, a fund, and the object is to help startups, essentially, to facilitate technology transfer. You know that as soon as you have finished the research and you start the industrialization, in reality, in between, you have that valley. We try to put money for that, and we will give 1 billion euro for that. Obviously, the Carnot system, for which we have given already 1.5 billion, is quite successful. And therefore, we decided to continue it with half a million euro. We do not know whether that is a success story or not. We will tell you maybe in 10 to 20 years. Uh, it's clear that we were feeling that our responsibility is to foster innovation. And in a country like France that is the fourth or the fifth country for scientific publication, we need to put together to get in closer contact the fundamental research and the private research. But we have to be careful to one thing. We have to respect the ecosystem. It would be a catastrophe if our fundamental researcher become a kind of hybrid researcher with industry. Each one, we have to continue to give money to fundamental research, to universities for academic research. And at the same time, we have to create bridges as dynamic as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wealth of experience from those eight uh, perspectives. They've told us about the role of government. They've told us about the role of companies. They've told us about the importance of attracting the best talent and how you incentivize it. They've talked about the change of the environment and the great potential for inclusive innovation. Um, we've also been given a reminder that not all these lessons will be directly applicable to other countries because all countries are different. So thank you for that enormous wealth. And with that, we pass on rapidly to the next session, which is about uh, developing an innovation ecosystem, which our last speaker very uh, kindly led us into. So can I pass over? I grabbed the baton from you. Thank you very much. And we look forward to engaging in a very healthy discussion about ecosystems. Uh, this was set up very nicely. Nicholas spoke about the uh, horizontal platforms, uh, how we go about facilitating uh, these great ideas to the marketplace is the discussion. We have uh, six robust speakers who will be sharing with us their views. In the same spirit, we'll try to be mindful of the clock and uh, we will try to reserve some time uh, to make up from the uh, earlier sessions if we could to reserve for uh, Q&A at the end. Uh, we want to come back to the UK and invite uh, I uh, Ian Gray, if you would be so kind. Uh, or, I hope I pronounced that right. Actually, you might well give me your first name right, if I may. Uh, to talk about the Technology Strategy Board at the UK. Okay, thank you uh, very much. You did pronounce my name right, I Ian Gray. I'm <laughs> good start. I'm the uh, Chief Executive of the uh, Technology Strategy Board. And what I'd like to try and do in the next sort of five minutes is paint a picture of um, who we are, what we're about. My background is um, I was managing director of Airbus in the UK. I spent 26 years in, in business. And um, I'm not untypical of the type of person who works with the Technology Strategy Board. It's a, a business-led organization albeit it's under the sponsorship of government and under the sponsorship of the Department of Business Innovation and Skills, which David Willits, our minister, talked about this morning. So the Technology Strategy Board is the UK's national um, innovation agency. We've been in place since about July 2007. We have a fairly simple definition of um, innovation, which is turning ideas into cash. It is about the, the goal of accelerating uh, economic growth by supporting business-led um, innovation. Over the last four years, we have jointly, in a public-private sector partnership, invested some £2 billion. 
Um, we have done that across some 4,000 companies. That ranges from some very large corporates, companies like Rolls-Royce, GSK, companies like Tata, companies like EDF, so it's not necessarily um, UK-owned companies, but companies that are investing in R&D in the UK. And in large companies, our objective is to ensure they continue to invest in R&D in the UK, and more than that, that they can be used to help build supply chains. At the other end of the spectrum, we're working with small startup companies. Imperial Innovations is a very good example. Companies like Novasem, which is a small uh, carbon negative uh, um, company developing new green technologies around cement, uh, a lot of support into small startup companies. So it's a complete spectrum, small companies through to large corporates right across the different sectors. We work across business, academia and government, a relatively small organisation, about 140 people, and I would say the characteristic and I would say the key to success of the organisation is that the majority of people in the organisation have been recruited from business and perhaps more importantly than that, I would foresee they will go back into business type of roles. So business is very much at the heart of what they're about. In terms of a UK innovation ecosystem, I won't talk too much to this slide, um, just to observe that through the course of the day, there is an awful lot of common vocabulary that uh, is being used. Somebody did say to me at lunch, I mean, one of the key things the UK innovation ecosystem misses is, is the weather. Perhaps we don't have the weather like San Francisco, but I think the two things I would pull out of that chart are world-leading research base and the venture capital market. In terms of building that UK innovation um, system, the Technology Strategy Board plays a role in the exploitation of science, technology um, and innovation. It is not involved in pure science research, nor is it involved in, in company um, product development, but it is involved in that sort of... Uh, um, trans transition, that, uh, that space that is taking ideas and moving them forward into the market. And in terms of the UK government's role towards building an innovation ecosystem in, in that space, the Technology Strategy Board sits alongside organisations like the Design Council. Design is a very key part of innovation. It sits alongside the Intellectual Property Office, Nesta and Jeff Mulgan talked to you this morning. And more importantly, it sits alongside organisations like British Standards, the National Measurement Office. Innovation is more than just about funding, it is about bringing different players in that ecosystem together. In terms of government action, um, creating business opportunity, we're often thought as a funding agency, one of the most important aspects of our organisation is we are much more than just a funding agency. And in terms of um, innovation, I would say stimulating the government's role in stimulating business innovation through policy, standards, regulation, and we've heard a number of times today, procurement is key. We are also a very strong proponent of the US-based um, SBIR scheme and have implemented SBRI as a pre-commercial procurement tool in, in the UK and are getting great traction across a number of government departments. Developing the system, well again, there's a lot of common vocabulary there. It's a, it's a changing system, so I, I, I won't talk about uh, um, the next two slides because I think it just says the same thing that others have said through the day. Again, I would reinforce a remarkable uh, convergence of vocabulary in the different presentations we've got. But instead, to finish off, maybe focus on two things. Global challenges. Um, we've heard about the role that global challenges can play in stimulating innovation and economic growth. We have developed a concept which we call innovation platforms. The key to innovation platforms is getting a government department to identify the societal challenge. More than that, for the government department to identify what success looks like in terms of that uh, societal challenge, and then to allow business and academia to work together to develop the solutions. We've identified six uh, innovation platforms, low carbon vehicles, the aging population, low impact buildings, detection of infectious agents, sustainable agri-food, and stratified medicine, and are starting to get real success in terms of 
um, business benefit deriving out of these innovation platforms. But the absolute key to it has been government themselves defining, helping to define what the challenge is and then helping to define what success looks like and then standing back from it and allowing business to develop the solutions and the business opportunities that arise. The UK has been through a number of phases of physical centres over the last 40 um, years. It seems to build them up, then sell them off. I think the role of physical centres in innovation landscape is hugely important. And in the last um, uh, 12 months, we heard our minister, David Willits, this morning talk about the money that the government is putting into technology and innovation centres. This is about building world-class skills, capability, and equipment and providing open access to small businesses to develop and, and actually fill that valley of death in terms of moving their products closer to marketplace. The government's invested some 250 million pounds on these. The first three technology and innovation centers have been uh, announced, high value manufacturing. A very strong message from me is the UK is serious about manufacturing. Perhaps that's not a perception that has uh, travelled across the globe uh, recently, but high-value manufacturing is, is vitally important, and there are seven physical centres, in, physical nodes in that high-value manufacturing centre. Stem cell and cell therapy is the second one. Offshore renewable energy is the third centre that we are developing, and we've committed to the government to identify three further centres and have them up and running by 2013 a relatively small number of focused centres that help small businesses and large businesses to develop um, their innovation models. From my perspective, I think uh, one of the things that has come through over the last um, four or five hours, culture and environment, innovation and building the ecosystem is all about people and building the networks that connect people, providing that right sort of culture is, is vital. So, Technology Strategy Board is at the heart of the innovation agenda in the UK. It's providing funding, it's getting involved in regulation, standards, pre-commercial procurement. But at the end of the day, innovation is about people and knowledge exchange, another key part of what the Technology Strategy Board is about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to now come back to India. And uh, Saurabh, I think Sam mentioned, is a member of the National Innovation Council. So please welcome uh, Dr. Saurabh Srivastava. Well, good afternoon, everyone. You know, India has historically always been a very innovative and an entrepreneurial country, except, I guess, for the last 300 years or so, uh, when it dropped from 25% of global GDP to like low single digits. Uh, what has happened though in the last decade or two is that DNA has resurfaced. And so the economy has been doing very well and we're building some great entrepreneurial industries. The IT industry of which I'm a part uh, with less than two decades has gone from like 70 million to 70 billion, headed for 250 billion by 2020 and Kiran Mazumdar sitting right there is doing exactly the same thing in biotechnology and life sciences. But good as it is, and we've added tens of millions of people to the middle class, we still remain home to an unacceptably large number of poor. And at the National Innovation Council, one of the things we have been wrestling with is how do we leverage this power of innovation and entrepreneurship for solving that particular problem? the problems of the poor. Today, the way that's handled is with two kinds of capital. You have philanthropy capital. The problem with that is it's not a very large amount of capital, and we have large problems. Uh, the best practices in the world say 1% of PBT goes to CSR. So a company that's doing a billion dollars of revenues would give a million dollars for CSR. That's best practice. It's a very small amount of money. It usually is given to NGOs, non-governmental organizations that do great work, but the people managing them 
are good people, but not the most efficient users of capital. They don't have organizational skills. And usually, therefore, when the money stops, the good work they're doing stops as well. The second intervention is government. Now, governments are usually not the best mechanisms for deploying and distributing this kind of money. And there, too, when the money stops, the good work stops. So what you really need is something different. What you really need is the ability to deploy this capital in a more efficient way by putting it in institutions and organizations which will be sustainable, which will continue to grow way beyond the initial use of the capital. And that way, you have disproportionate impact. In India, that's what we need, disproportionate impact. We're not talking of one or two million people. We're talking very large numbers of people. And so one of the things that we therefore thought we would do is to see how do we leverage both the entrepreneurship and the construct that allows this kind of entrepreneurship to bloom, which is traditionally the venture capital construct, to create a large fund. Our aspiration is a billion dollars. But this would be a very different kind of fund, although the construct would be a venture capital construct. The one thing that would allow us to do is two things. A, create those scalable ventures. And B, it would allow us to get the best brains in India and the world to solve, to apply their minds in solving the problems of the poor. These are the brains that are today engaged in solving the problems of the affluent. This was a construct we thought would best do it. What we're doing in the fund is using a small amount of public money to actually leverage a much larger amount of private and institutional capital in that fund. It will be managed privately. We will invest only in ventures that have high impact at the base of the pyramid. But in ventures that are scalable, therefore would have to be profitable, and in ventures that would continue to sustain beyond the initial investment of capital. It has other differences too. Normally, a venture fund would target a high rate of return. In this one, we have a modest target, a rate of return of 10%. But what we also promise the people who invest in the fund is apart from a 10% financial return, a 10% IRR, they would also get a social return. And I was talking to Jeff Mulgan just a bit earlier, we're developing metrics to be able to say what has happened with the money. What is the social return? Is it that the 10 million that you invested gave you a 10% IRR, but also created 5,000 jobs? There are several metrics to do that. So we would have that. The people who manage the fund would actually be judged and incentivized on a dual pattern. One, 50% on what is the return they give financially, and the other 50% on what is was the return given in social terms. So we are trying to do a mix of that in an innovative way to take a certain pool of capital, multiply it by getting resources from outside of government, of public sources, then again use the power of entrepreneurship. And one of the reasons we think we would work in this experiment is best tried in India is people have done this in, on a small scale in different places. But India, unfortunately for the wrong reason, has scale in this area. We have a large market. We also, while we have those problems, we also now have world-class entrepreneurs who come with a very middle-class mindset because they come from these small, smaller towns and villages. To do this, there is today access to the world's best technology, whether produced locally or globally. To solve that, uh, we have now a telecom infrastructure that allows us to go wherever we, we want to go. And so in every way, there is a very, very high combination of parameters that says to us this could be done successfully. And there are a number of examples today within India where ventures of this kind, organizations of this kind, are doing great work and have scaled. Now, we do realize there are challenges as well. So one of the things we're also doing, which would not normally happen in a venture fund, is we also have resources set aside where we would provide very high quality mentoring of business on organizational issues, as well as many elements of skilling. 
because when we invest in these kind of ventures, they will need that help in order to succeed. We do that in angel investing, but this would be at a different level. So we're providing that as well to make it work. Uh, I'm very encouraged, I must say, we're all very encouraged by the fact that as we've reached out to see who can we get to come on board and help manage this, uh, these initiatives in the process, uh, the best brains in the world are keen to do this. We've talked to people who are extremely successful entrepreneurs at a global level, have generated hundreds of millions of dollars of wealth for themselves and their investors. They're willing to drop that and do this as the next piece. The people who manage and are managing large global venture funds who are actually ready to come in and do this. So there is no question in our minds that we can get absolutely outstanding people to apply their minds to what needs to be done. And the reason it's very important, we feel, is that if indeed we do a billion dollar fund, we do a 10% IRR to investors, and we give them social returns, it will unlock a different asset class of money, which is not philanthropy capital, which is very small, but which is a capital that expects financial returns. That capital is always very much larger, but which will also get social returns. And with that capital, creating sustainable ventures, we would be able to actually have several such funds come up in India, elsewhere in the world, as they see how this is working. And we may well have created, on scale, a very different way of solving the problems of the poor. So that is our ambition. That's uh, what we're working on. Uh, I would love, we would all love at, NI, at the Innovation Council to work with all of you. Uh, when we say inclusive growth, we mean inclusive even in this way. We'd love to take advantage of your experience or what you have learned to bring it in. And at the end, when this works, we would be delighted if all of this experience is then taken by everybody else in other countries where uh, exactly the same needs exist. So we are in fundraising mode. Any of you who want to write checks, I'll be here all of today, all of tomorrow. Please do get in touch. Thank you. Well, well said. Thank you. Uh, our former Vice President for the World Bank in Europe, uh, Jean-Francois Richard. Did I say that right? All right. Progress. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm, we're here to share thoughts and uh, experience. I will share some rebellious thinking with you, uh, with some tentative thoughts on the question of an e innovation ecosystem. I'll have two messages. From a government policy standpoint, it's not about developing an innovation e ecosystem. It's about developing three types of innovation ecosystems. And one of those three fits particularly well with inclusive innovation. My experience is, and it's confirmed by the discussions today, is that we all talk about innovation, but amazingly, we don't have a typology of the various strands of contemporary innovation. Uh, an example of this fuzzy thinking is if you look at the OECD strategy on uh, innovation, all you get from it is things like uh, there is a wide range of complementary technological and non-technological innovations. Thank you very much. That doesn't help very much. Then comes inevitably a sentence like science continues to be an essential ingredient of innovation. And then the document goes on and on and talks only about science and technology and research and development. This morning in the first session, two-thirds of the speakers spoke mostly about research and development. Only a third mentioned other forms of innovation driven by other things. So no wonder that for most countries' governments, and I'm working a lot on, in the Middle East with my colleagues from the World Bank on innovation policy, for many countries, innovation policy tends to have mostly a science and technology research and development focus even if you use words like innovation ecosystems. And the reason is it's obviously very difficult to come up with a typology of innovation. 
So I am asking myself the question, why don't we start not from distinguishing between various types of innovation, but with a distinction between various types of innovators? What are the archetype innovators? And I think there are three types, at least in modern innovation practice. One type is the one we are most familiar with, much discussed today. The, this is a science or engineer type, often with a PhD, who engages in research and development for new products, new technical processes, sometimes even new services. He's generally at the heart of the traditional var variety of technological innovation. You could call it research and development driven innovation strand. That's the first strand. The second strand is what I would call the creative class driven strand. That second type of innovator actually uses existing technologies, recombines them with new ex other technologies and ideas and knowledge from all over the world into new products, new services, new ways of doing things. He may or may not have a degree at all, and it's not often a science degree. Most of the times, degree is irrelevant, because the main requirement for that type of innovator is this deep vein of self-regenerating, self-confident, out-of-the-box creativity. It's often a young person, or someone at least young at heart, and in many countries, they tend to cluster in attractive and lively cities that have outstanding living conditions. They come up with things that were not available before, new ways to manage traffic, new software games that create millions of addicts, novel ways of advertising through electronic media, new theater plays, movie scripts, new TV series, clever devices to monitor medical patients while at home, new tourist for formulas, new ways to package produce, etc. They often thrive on internet and IT, and quite a bit of today's innovation re re gyrates around that strand of innovator, which has very little to do with the first strand of innovation. I call that strand the creative class-driven innovation strand. It's a very different world. The third type of archetype innovator is someone you will often find at the helm of a game-changing company or inside a game-changing company. It's someone who will have a knack for creating value by inventing or reinventing business models, business processes, reinventing supply chains. In short, it's someone rethinking the way things get done. It's neither a science PhD, nor is it uh, one of these young people without a degree of the second strand. It's someone who may or may not possess an MBA type degree, but knows how to analyze margins, cost margins, break even points, and so forth and is good at squeezing out the best possible value proposition for meeting clients' needs more effectively than others were able to. They often use IT and internet as well, not so much as such, but as props for reinventing the way things get done, for instance, the way one interacts with suppliers and customers. In the US, this sort of innovation has represented a very large chunk of the increase in the productivity growth rate in the 90s. It was called the Walmart effect, for some of you who remember the name. I call that strand the business model reinvention driven innovation strand. And I think the three are different. They're all a little bit blurred in reality, but they are very different in their requirements. They each, in a way, need their ecosystem. The first ecosystem is the one for science and technology. You want happy innovators in that area. These are the science PhDs, the engineers. They need certain things in their ecosystems. They need a growing community of first-rate scientists around them. There must be a critical mass of respected university research centers. There must be no barriers impeding scientists coming in or leaving the country. There has to be a minimum basic research base uh, in the country. A balance of basic applied and commercialization R&D. Strong incentives for private sector involvement in R&D. And proper emphasis on the commercialization end. They also need a good research environment, proper salaries, 
proper social standing amongst their peers of all over the world. They produce mostly new products and new processes, sometimes new services. The second strand of innovators, these creative recombination type innovators, possibly without a degree, they need very different ecosystems. They need high caliber a variety and size in the creative class presence in the country or in the city or in the state. They need respect and autonomy bestowed on them as creative types in their society. They need an exceptionally favorable environment for startups. They need an absence of impediments for professional service exports because they're often into services. They need a critical mass of sophisticated service industries, particularly IT industries around them. A critical mass of design and other creative industries, including movie industries, media, entertainment, and so forth. And they need plenty of sophisticated users that they can engage with. They also need to have a good ecosystems, outstanding living conditions, lively creative industries, ecologies, to keep them from having to go to another country, another location. Richard Florida has written much about that. And finally, the third business model reinvention strand, that's quite different. That is actually often the strand that has larger corporations involved. The good ecosystem there will have a high quality variety and depths in the country's enterprise mesh and universe. It will have a lot of bold innovative firms within that universe. It will have companies that are game changers and work in complex advanced fields. It will have many companies with flexible organizational approaches. It will have companies exposed to the winds of worldwide competition. It be an environment open to new business models without legacy hang-ups. For instance, this morning we heard about Council of Nurses holding up certain in innovations that were mentioned by Dr. Mehta. So you need actually a very, very good business environment for these, whether they're large firms or small firms, that the business model reinvention area requires a lot of business environment perfection. There are then five types of policies that the government can help with, and sometimes they will be differentiated depending on the ecosystem. Sometimes they will be joint and common. I'm not going to go through the details of them because this was done for Jordan, not for India, so it doesn't apply entirely. But the five kinds of policies are innovator attraction and innovation support policies is one. Second one is innovation personnel development policies, including starting from early childhood education all the way up to long, lifelong learning. The third one is how to promote dynamic entrepreneurship through various policies and support systems. The fourth one is networking and knowledge access. And the last one is innovation demand side policies. So that's the, I, I think by not distinguishing these things uh, enough, we actually miss a lot of mentions of not only innovation, but also what the government can do to create a lively innovation scenery for the whole country. And that's my main point, uh, and I'm running out of time. I would have, if I had more time, I would say that the, most of the inclusive innovation examples that I've heard today and in read about uh, fit with the third column of business model in innovation and have a lot of kindred spirit with that area and could be supported in the same way one would support that general line of business. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to have Karen join us to talk about uh, innovations. I guess you also remember the Innovation Council, Karen, and uh, chairs Biocon, one of the leading uh, biotech companies in India. Thanks, Anish. Uh, I'm going to sort of uh, shift gears a bit because I thought a lot of people have spoken about, you know, their view of the ecosystem and what what have you. 
And I thought I would share with you what the state government of Karnataka, where I uh, have my company in Bangalore, has done right from the very start when they started looking at high technology and you know, not even knowing about what they were doing, they've actually inadvertently created a very, very interesting, exciting, and diverse ecosystem uh, in and around Bangalore and around Karnataka, for that matter. So the first thing that, uh, you know, the government of Karnataka did was to really experiment with a model of a public-private partnership when it came to developing a technology strategy for the state in IT and biotechnology. And here what they did was they created vision groups chaired by myself in biotechnology and Mr. Narayan Murthy in IT. And this was a very unique model being pioneered for the first time, I think, anywhere. I mean, certainly for India. And what they did was they gave us carte blanche. They ba basically said, you choose the members you want in this vision group and you roll out a strategy document for the state government for us to adopt. So it included members from government, which really included the secretary IT and biotechnology, who's one person who's, who, who sort of straddles both sectors, uh, people from academia and other members from industry, including from multinational companies. So it was a pretty diverse group of, of, of members in this vision group. And this vision group was set up, you know, in, in the year 2000. So it's basically now, you know, a decade old. And I think it has been a very, very successful model. Because here is one uh, ecosystem which starts with a platform where we all are stakeholders working together, jointly trying to evolve policies and roadmaps um, for the state of Karnataka in these two technology sectors. Um, as vision group leaders, I think we clearly recognize that you had to have an ecosystem anchored around um, educational centers of excellence. And certainly, you know, we were fortunate that Karnataka and Bangalore had existing centers of excellence like the Indian Institute of Science, the National Aeronautical Laboratories, uh, the um, uh, you know, various universities, University of Agricultural Sciences in various parts of the state and what have you. So what we did was, A, we started off uh, the concept of creating a clustered approach by creating these technology parks. And these technology parks were anchored by uh, really sort of startup academic centers. The IT park was anchored by the IIIT, the Indian Institute of Information Technology. And the biotech park was anchored by uh, a, an academic institute called the Institute for Bioinformatics and Applied Biotechnology. What we also then did was that these technology parks were then managed in a very autonomous, private sector-oriented way. Uh, the IT park, uh, which now is Electronic City, is, as you know, populated by a very diverse cluster of IT companies. And the biotech uh, park that is now coming up actually is being developed by a US uh, company, Alexandria, to help us really create a very interesting um, uh, technology park, a biotechnology park, which will encompass both homegrown and uh, international companies. I think we really ended up creating a very, very interesting ecosystem as a result of that. The technology park is extremely diverse, both in, in both sectors. And what it has resulted in is that we've been able to create a huge ecosystem of hundreds of thousands of technology workers, okay? So we've got a very nice talent pool of uh, people. I think when you talk about technology, uh, eco I mean, when you talk about innovation ecosystems, I think it's very important to have a very rich talent pool of people uh, who can actually flow in and out of organizations, companies, academics, and 
And I think you need to create that kind of an ecosystem, which we've actually inadvertently created in, in uh, Bangalore. Um, what has also happened is that uh, this has resulted in Bangalore really being in a sort of a leadership position in both these technologies. Uh, in the biotech sector, uh, Karnataka actually is home to 50% of India's biotech companies. So out of the 400 odd biotech companies, Karnataka alone is home to around a little over 200. And these are extremely diverse companies. In fact, what's happened is most other states who have tried to copy this model, but they've done it through government strategies, they have ended up becoming very homogenous kind of uh, you know, uh, technology sectors. So for instance, uh, if you look at Andhra Pradesh, it's a very pharma-focused, biopharma-focused uh, biotechnology sector. Uh, Karnataka has a huge mix of agri-biotech, industrial biotech, pharma biotech, informatics-based, genomics-based companies. So it's, it, it becomes very interesting because we can feed off each other. Okay. Um, it also has been very positive for uh, the innovation space because, you know, most uh, large companies have actually chosen to set up their innovation hubs in India, in Bangalore. GE, for instance, has set up its, you know, its, its uh, innovation hub in, in Bangalore. Um, Texas Instruments for a very long time has set up its innovation hub in Bangalore. Um, AstraZeneca has one of its big research hubs in Bangalore, and Bristol Myers Squibb has set up a very large research hub in Bangalore. So it's very interesting to see how these kind of strategies have helped to create an ecosystem which now is only growing and evolving because the, the foundation is so strong. So I think when you're going about creating uh, ecosystems, it's very important to make sure that you have a very good mix of stakeholders when you try and evolve policies to create ecosystems. It is not, you know, the answers are not all there right up front. I think it's an evolving model. And I think you must let it evolve. Because if you structure it too much, you won't get the right uh, kind of uh, model or the right form. Another thing that has helped us is that once we've got this ecosystem going, we've now been able to actually further strengthen uh, the, uh, the ecosystem in many of these sectors where we've then chosen to go out of Bangalore, where, you know, Mysore has become a big uh, hub, both for biotechnology and for IT. Uh, Mangalore has become a big hub for marine biotechnology. And again, IT has, you know, become a very important part of Mangalore's, um, you know, growth uh, agenda. Uh, similarly, we've looked at other parts of Karnataka where we've looked at uh, Hubli Dharwar for agricultural biotechnology. We've looked at uh, coastal uh, Karnataka for, for uh, you know, marine-based uh, biofuels and things like that. So I think it's once the ecosystem gets formed, you can very easily start further strategizing into segmentation based on very thought out strategies. So I think I could keep going on and on, but I just thought I'll end there by saying that this has been a very ex you know, interesting experiment which has started with a very innovative model. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we have just two more guests, and uh, I am mindful that we're trying to catch up from where we were before. so. Uh, Stuart, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we'll get, get you next, uh, all the way from my neighbor in Canada, uh, Stuart Beck, and then we'll wrap up with uh, Dr. Guerrero. Great. Well, thank you very much. I guess you're wondering why a diplomat's been invited to this August group. Uh, there is a bit of rationale behind it because uh, um, our department is the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, and I come from the international trade side of the house. I've been 29 years as a trade commissioner. I opened our office in Silicon Valley in the mid-80s, and I just came from... Uh, the valley to, uh, uh, to Delhi uh, um, last year. So um, I think about innovation a little bit differently, and I guess I should also explain, uh, before I went to, to San Francisco last year, I was the Assistant Deputy Minister for International Business Development, Investment and Innovation. And when I took the job, it was International Business Development, Investment and Science and Technology. And I changed the name to Innovation because 
the focus was really too much of our people in the field looking at developing you know, science and technology partnerships uh, between universities and academic institutions. And what I really wanted them to focus on is how do we get business engaged in the innovation space. So when I take a look at, you know, Jean uh, Francois did a great job of defining innovation, I think, but I kind of look at it a little bit differently. Uh, innovation is an, uh, invention is an idea that made, uh, made manifest. Innovation ideas applied successfully. Innovation must, be led, uh, must lead to positive change, and innovation is driven by entrepreneurs. So it's about business at the end of the day in terms of what we're trying to do. Now, I said the, the title of this uh, talk is uh, Canada, uh, How Do We Catalyze Innovation? Uh, and I have to say that, you know, if you think back to where we were in the mid-90s, we were somewhere similar to, uh, uh, to India. We were really suffering, um, you know, from a debt problem. And the IMF uh, didn't actually come in and tell us what to do, but they knocked on the door. So um, there were some dramatic changes that were uh, taken. In 97, actually, we turned our first surplus. And that surplus uh, was applied to uh, research and development. It was a wise decision at that time. We had 11 years of budget surpluses in Canada. And we grew our science and technology ecosystem tremendously. Uh, and uh, you know, some of these factors are, are as a result of, uh, of the ecosystem that we now have in place in Canada. The problem is uh, there's a tremendous amount of money being spent on science and technology. But you know, the government of today says, uh, where's the beef? Uh, how does that translate into the creation of wealth and economic development? So again, and, and I'm. I, Dr. Ehrlich, uh, I met at the very beginning of my term as Assistant Deputy Minister way back when, uh, and he was talking uh, about the venture capital system that they put in place in Israel, and I was envious, and all Canadians are envious of what Israel has done, and the reality is our, our venture capital system is somewhat broken. So we have to take a look at different ways and leveraging on what we have in place. So I'll quickly zip through this, this part. I mean, I, I think most people, in, well, David Naylor just walked in the door. We have a great... Uh, uh, science, and technology, uh, science and technology landscape from an academic perspective. We've got great research universities in Canada and, and some other uh, uh, universities right, through, right across the country. Um, we have these network centers of excellence that have been created by the government, which are uh, really very important uh, as part of um, that innovation framework. Okay? And uh, they are, there are 20 networks uh, that are supported across the country, including stem cell uh, research, uh, photonics, uh, obesity, Arctic, a variety of different areas that are important to Canada. And it's, it, again, it's the, uh, the combination of the uh, academic industry and government and not-for-profit organizations. Uh, we also have business-led uh, centers of excellence, uh, and uh, a few of those are listed above. Uh, and they are focused on drug discovery, uh, uh, nanotechnology, uh, new next generation aviation technology, sustainable challenges related to hydro carbon production. Uh, again, unique models of uh, combining the private sector and, and the academic environment. Um, and we have uh, centers of excellence for commercialization and research. And there are 22 of those centers across the country. And they're in a variety of different areas, and not some we work quite closely with. Uh, and you, see, you, know, you have uh, centers of excellence on water, for example, in Waterloo, not because of the name, because that's where a lot of technology is actually uh, in the water space is done. And, uh, uh, we've done a, uh, an independent study, and when you talk about water technology, you know, Canada is really at the top of the, of the heap in that particular space. And in fact, uh, we work quite closely with Israel, and not too long ago we had a, pro a program here between Israel, ourselves, and India on water and water technology. Um, when we talk about new platforms uh, for commercialization of Canadian innovations, we have great examples of that. And I don't know if David talked about Mars this morning, but it's really a a super place of convergence of technology with business and the legal environment. It's located in the old uh, Toronto General Hospital, right downtown in, in Toronto. In fact, uh, Richard Florida has his Center uh, for Creativity uh, there and, as part of Mars. Um, again, a, a place that you bring people together to talk about business and to create opportunity. And it's not just business for the sake of make, making money, it's social uh, entrepreneurs as well. Uh, working in that environment. The Digital Media Zone is another good example in, uh, in Toronto. We have Communi Communitech in uh, Waterloo. We have Wavefront uh, in Vancouver. All institutions that are, uh, uh, how, do we, how do we create wealth from the growth of companies? And that's the, that's the basic uh, understanding behind that. There's another center uh, uh, of excellence uh, called the Center for Commercialization of Research. I sit on the advisory board of that. Uh, it's in Toronto, it's a part of the Ontario Centers of Excellence. And the whole focus of that 
organization, and we have a very strong board, uh, and the organization itself, and the funding is directed at working with universities' pr professors to commercialize their research. That, that is where we focus on that one, and it's money that's spent directly on that, and it's a national center of excellence, so this, whatever we learn from that is spread across the country. Um, the, uh, the one example I wanted to give you in terms of a practical approach that we've been taking uh, in this area. Uh, when I was in San Francisco, we developed a, what I would call an ecosystem around companies. We would do a, what we would call a boot camp. Uh, we did two a year, one going across Eastern Canada, one going across Western Canada. In those boot camps, we would bring experts in, venture capitalists in many cases, to take a look at the companies in the various regions. So if we went across Eastern Canada, we did six cities, we would probably look at 150 to 200 companies. We would filter those uh, 150 companies down to uh, 30 that we would invite to, uh, to Silicon Valley. And in Silicon Valley, we had an incubator uh, within plug and play. For those people who know the Valley, they know plug and play. And that's a commercial uh, incubator. It's not one run by the government. It's a for-profit for incubator. And the whole idea of putting those companies in that environment is to see whether or not they'll fail and, and to develop uh, the ability to, to um, understand how to grow their business model. Because for Canada, we're not a country of entrepreneurs. We are becoming a country of entrepreneurs, but historically we haven't been a country of entrepreneurs. And so what we're seeing now is a much more dynamic, young, typically second generation immigrant coming in and becoming those entrepreneurs. So what, what can we do to help them? So by putting them into the valley for three months, we cover the cost of that. They learn very quickly whether or not they're going to succeed. And if they do succeed, then we can build the model out. And we tie them into a mentoring network, and we, we have uh, plagiarized very much from the Israeli model and from the Indian model. Thai is a wonderful or, or organization that we work with there. So we've created a group called the C100, which are C-suite uh, Canadians in the valley. Um, and uh, just, so, just so you understand the numbers, we have 300,000 Canadians in, in the Northern California. And some are in, in very ser uh, senior positions in, uh, in organizations in the valley. Uh, we have uh, Canadian uh, venture capitalists and, and serial entrepreneurs. They are the mentors to these, to these group of companies that come in there, and they help them build their model out. And I'll just leave on, a, on an example about what I was talking in terms of innova uh, innovation. But one, of the, one of the companies that's been very successful out of that incubator is a company from St. John, New Brunswick. I don't know how many people in this room would know, would know where St. John is. Um, small, uh, small, well, not relatively small city in, in New Brunswick. Uh, this company had a great business model, and it was something that we all understand. Uh, when we buy stuff from Amazon, we have it delivered to our home. If we're not there, where does it go? It goes back to UPS or FedEx or whatever. They developed a business model where you could, when you um, uh, order your goods and you're not home, you could have it dropped off at your local drugstore or your dry cleaner or wherever you may be. Well, again, it's a small company. They didn't really understand how to grow that model. Went into the uh, plug-and-play incubator, met the right people, found the right funding. They built their model out across the United States, and that added 15 programmers in St. John. So the marketing uh, was done out of the Valley, but all the back-end work was done out of St. John. And it's not rocket science, and it's not the next uh, invention, but it's a different business model going to your point uh, about how you change a business model and how you create economic development and employment. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. We'll wrap this session with my neighbor to the south, uh, Dr. Guerrero. We'll say a few words from uh, Mexico, please. Well, thank you again. In Mexico, we used to have two kind of um, mechanism for, um, for R&D, for the enterprises and for the science, university, etc. But uh, it's very important to have a mechanism, an hybrid mechanism for both, because you have to have uh, there the, um, the demand and the needs of the enterprises. Then, as um, my colleagues from India, they explained very well the, um, the, two, the two big um, uh, important, uh, let me say, networkings that we are doing here. In Mexico, we are trying to do these kind of things. I'm not going to, to explain more about that. I would like to, to talk more about universities and the problem and universities to become more entrepreneurial universities. As you know, at the university, we have two, two very important roles. New science, students, 
to have very, very good students. But the problem is then what? How we can make business, how we can be related with the um, enterprises, how we can select the best uh, inventions in order to put money in these inventions and to try to develop prototypes and uh, then to try to sell the technology. It's really a big issue in Mexico. Then in Mexico, we have, uh, let me say, salaries, decent salaries for the researcher. Then they don't want to work with the with enterprises. It's more risk. You have to, um, to, to, um, to get out of your university. Then this is a real problem in countries. I don't know in India, I don't know in others, but in Mexico is a problem. Then we have to convince these research people that they can, me they can be more entrepreneurial. We, can, we have to get them incentives to do that. And this is uh, not very easy. Then in Mexico, we changed the law. Science and technology now is science, technology, and innovation. The royalties for the research people can go up to 70%. It's, uh, it's a way to convince uh, the, the researcher that you can, they can make um, more business with the, with the enterprises. And also, it's very important in Mexico, the culture for the students, because, you know, our students, they would like to work in one company or for the government, and they have to think also that they can put a new enterprise, they can use the knowledge in order to, to develop something.